ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Angela Stent. I'm director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies here at Georgetown University. And I am delighted to welcome you here tonight. Thanks for coming out on this frigid, frigid night. Uh, but we have a stellar panel here tonight. So I know that you will decide at the end that it was very much worth your while. Um, and what we're doing is we're discussing the second edition of a very well-received book that they've written. And at this point, I would like to hold up a copy for you, but they haven't arrived yet. Um, so you will see it, um, <laughs> hopefully, when, you, uh, when we're done with this and you'll be able to purchase some copies of the book. Um, but, um, uh, and the book is edited by uh, Jan Politsky and David Goldwyn. And uh, it deals with, it's called um, Energy and Security, and it deals really with a wide variety of global energy issues, which they're going to talk about tonight. Um, it's a very timely book if you just think about a few things that are in the news every day. Uh, the U.S. shale revolution and its uh, implications really globally, very unexpected uh, and continuing implications. Um, there's the Iran deal that may be on the horizon that could have a major impact on uh, the global energy situation. Uh, the ongoing turmoil in the Middle East, obviously, and in Ukraine. And I know we're going to talk about Ukraine tonight as well because that too has major implications uh, for the global energy system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the four members of the panel, and then I'm going to have each one of them speak, um, and then we can have your questions and answers, and I'll introduce them all now, uh, and then we will start, first of all, with David Goldwyn. He's president of Glo Goldwyn Global Strategies. He served as Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's Special Envoy and Coordinator for International Energy Affairs. He's been Assistant Secretary of Energy for International Affairs. He's been National Security Deputy to the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Chief of Staff to the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He is a non-resident senior fellow at, Brookings, at the Brookings Institution. He is a member of the National Petroleum Council and an alternate member of the U.S. Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative Steering Group. Our second speaker will be Jan Politsky. He is a senior scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Center and at the Kennan Institute. He's the chairman of the Eurasia Foundation. He's a counselor for international strategy at Chevron. He has served in the White House as the NIS Ombudsman. He's been counselor to the US Department of Commerce in the Clinton administration. He was on the State Department's policy planning staff serving Secretaries Kissinger and Vance. Uh, and he was chief uh, foreign policy advisor to Senator Edward Kennedy. Uh, he's also taught at a number of universities, including Georgetown, but also Brown University, Harvard, Princeton, and the London School of Economics. Oh Our third speaker is Julia Nene. She's a director for Russian and Caspian Energy at IHS, where she provides clients with risk analysis for investments in the oil and gas industry. Uh, she worked closely with her clients identifying the uh, political and economic risk for the oil and gas sector in countries from the ground up. She has in-depth contacts inside those countries, uh, including <clears throat> uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia, Turkmenistan, Turkey, Ukraine, and Uzbekistan. And our final speaker will be Professor Brenda Schaefer. She's a specialist on energy and foreign policy, energy security policies, Azerbaijan, the Caucasus, Caspian energy, and Eastern Mediterranean energy issues. Uh, she's a visiting researcher at Ceres at our center at Georgetown. She's also taught a course here on Caspian energy. Um, she's on sabbatical from the University of Haifa, where she's a professor in the School of Political Science. Uh, so um, I think we will begin first with you, David. Would you like to stand up, or are you going to speak I'll from I'll speak from here, okay. uh, Great. you all can, can hear me in the back. Sure. First of all, uh, thank you, Angela, and thank you, Brenda, for, for hosting this event for us. It's nice to be back on campus, College 81, um, uh, and, um, and also we're really honored, um, you know, and Julie and I to be with such leading scholars in this field as, as the two of you. Um, this book that we uh, are not holding up right now, Energy and Security, is the second edition of, uh, of, uh, of a book that Jan and I have, uh, have edited with such leading lights as Dan Jurgen, who you may have heard of, um, uh, a guy named Ernie Moniz, who's, uh, who's doing some work in our Department of Energy right now, um, and a variety of people, Republicans, Democrats, OPEC, non-OPEC, uh, Americans, and, and people from around the world. And the, the common theme of this book 
is that the U.S. energy landscape has changed, but neither the public nor policymakers have really caught up with that change. And after 40 years of energy dependency, it's hard for people to accept that we have surpluses of oil and gas, maybe even exportable surpluses, and even harder to process what that means for foreign policy. Uh, long story, and long story short, and it's a long story because the book is about 800 pages, <laughs> uh, is that we think, and many of our contributors think, that this new self-sufficiency, um, if we embrace it, two, two, two questions there, offers the United, chance, the United States the chance to help make oil and gas markets more competitive, to help climate change by driving the substitution of gas for coal worldwide, to reduce the impact of supply disruptions around the world, both by increasing production here and propagating our technology abroad and democratizing access to energy, and creating linkages rather than competition, both with producers and with consumers. And we think this will happen not by energy independence, which to the extent people define energy independence as autarky, we think is both um, an unhelpful and even a, a dangerous concept, but by interdependence, by connecting to global markets, by propagating our technology, by building collective responses, and reducing everybody's dependence on oil, not just those in the United States. So in, in his time, Jan is going to explain the, the system that we propose, a global energy security system. But I want to talk about the insecurity part of our title today, which is, um, thank you. Oh. There's the tone. Now you can wave it around. <laughs> Assigned reading, we hope, in somebody's class here at George Depp. Um, so I want to talk about why this energy boom in the US is so important because of the kind of insecurity that we're going to see in the Middle East in the future, the insecurity we're seeing now, and something which I think will continue for, for, for quite a while to come. So just to survey the terrain uh, a little bit, Three of the four greatest sources of oil supply disruption that we saw last year came from the Middle East. <clears throat> Those were from Iran, Libya, and Iraq. Nigeria was number four. So how does it look? Libya, down about a million barrels a day, having a national dialogue and a constituent assembly, probably a year away from appointing the people who will decide the constitution, which will draft the laws that will rule the country. Security, um, uh, really, um, non-existent right now, no national forces. Libya is just building a nation, but their supply is offline, not likely to come back for a while, certainly not likely to grow, I think, for, for quite a while. And most of US engagement now is in trying to provide um, training for basic security. So, so that's for Libya. Algeria, an aging leadership, President Bouteflika probably will be reelected. But Algeria, in the best of times, had trouble <coughs> attracting more investment given the terms that it had on offer. Its own political consensus makes it uh, quite, a, quite a challenge, so companies are exiting Algeria. So the prospect for new investment, not good there either. Egypt, under force majeure, the subsidies are uh, basically screwed up all the oil production. Now it seems they won't be a gas exporter either. So uh, Fareed Mohammadi, uh, one of our contributors, said uh, this, this part of the world, which everyone thought was the source of the next great oil supply, which was the hot place to be five years ago, basically a non-strategic factor for the future. <coughs> so move to the southern Gulf, Saudi Arabia, the only country in the southern Gulf that is investing in oil supply, but its domestic consumption is growing. It's uncertain whether prices are going to go up or down, whether Iraq is going to come into OPEC or not, and therefore whether it's wise or prudent to be investing in greater oil production as opposed to cutting back production to elevate price. Um, the uh, uh, the spare capacity, still mostly in Saudi Arabia, is about 2.2 million barrels a day. That's pretty thin in an 80 million barrel a day world. So uh, you've got succession issues, not much of a cushion. <coughs> UAE, Kuwait, basically not investing. So not a lot of growth there. The northern Gulf, you've got Iraq internally divided, um, basically limited by the existing infrastructure that it has. And you have uh, the Kurdish region of the north, which has a terrific regime for attracting investment. And it thinks it's going to do a deal with Turkey to export that. But my own view is that that's highly unlikely for a while to come. Turkey is not about to cut Baghdad loose. The Kurds are not going to cut off the, the cash flow that they have from the capital anytime <coughs> soon. And Iraq is quite vulnerable, um, both from uh, the Sunni insurgency, which is growing. And Syria has had ex an extremely negative effect on the whole region. The Kurds are emboldened, and the Iraqis are more fearful that any grant of sovereignty that they give is likely to lead to more disaggregation in the country. 
Iran, which we'll talk about more in the Q&A, is probably the biggest wild card. <coughs> uh, things go bad. We're looking at a significant disruption in the Persian Gulf, maybe military action, prices near $140, and probably limited exports by a lot of others. On the other hand, if you have a deal with Iran, the production comes back on even slowly, then you're going to have an earthquake in the energy industry. All of our Caspian policy was to get around Iran. Iranian gas could flow to other countries. Iranian oil would be the hot place to invest if they can agree to, to reasonable terms. <coughs> so you would have um, a, a war inside OPEC. As Iraq maybe comes back into OPEC, Iran decides it wants more quota, and the Saudis have to decide how much they're going to lose national revenue to make room for the others. Um, so our, our um, uh, Rod Akadiri and Robin, Robin West, who wrote our, um, our chapter on the Gulf, um, think that there are enormous pressures on them, both for budget um, and for investment. So we're not looking at a lot of stability in that region. And, and lastly, with respect to, to OPEC, Ed Morris and Amy Jaffe, who wrote the chapter there, look at all these issues and U.S. production, Canadian production, <coughs> biofuels, flat demand, and say the Saudis are going to have a heck of a time creating discipline when they've got to make room for an Iranian adversary, an Iraq that wants to come in with five million barrels a day for, for quota, and have to raise money for their own economy as well. So our, our conclusion here is that while you have this enormous insecurity in the Middle East, this is actually a bit of an opportunity for foreign policy because our ability, the US ability, to provide oil and gas to the market overall creates a way for us to reach out to the Asians because the Middle East affects Asian physical supply of energy. For us, it's a price issue, but for them, it's physical supply. So the last couple of years, we were able to do Iran sanctions because our production, Canadian production, pretty much entirely made up for what came offline in Iran and Libya. What would it mean if we could directly export gas to Japan? What would it mean if we could directly export oil to, to Korea and to Japan? How much more appealing would our sanctions policy be, would our foreign policy be, if we were able to not just exhort people to follow it, but were able to provide direct help? So this kind of common cause with Asia on security, our also ability to help the, the Saudis use something other than oil for electricity. And we have lots that we can do with each of these countries while they are insecure to help them work better, but basically to give us tools for foreign policy. So, um, so that's, uh, that's really the, the, you know, a, a little teaser for our, for our, uh, for our thesis. But um, as much as there's a crisis worldwide, we now have the ability to help ourselves. And the question really is, from a policy point of view, whether we're willing to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, many thanks again, uh, Angela and Brenda, uh, for hosting us here at the uh, Mordara Center in Georgetown. It's great to be back. I uh, see many old friends and co colleagues here, and I, I remember enjoying tremendously my teaching stint here some good years ago. It was really uh, a highlight. Um, when we uh, began work on the second edition, uh, our authors and we were just talking about revising and updating and, you know, doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and we'd be all set. And then we looked at how the world of energy has changed since our first edition in 2005. And it's been a major revamp. I mean, it really has, because uh, all of the changes in the landscape, uh, the tremendous surge in production here in North America, uh, the blurring of the lines uh, between producers and consumers. Producers now are consumers. Consumers are producers. Uh, the landscape changes that David has described. And, and what I'd like to do is uh, just talk about a couple of the issues that arise in the Russian Eurasian area. Julie and I co-authored uh, the chapter on Russian Eurasia, but Julia, since hopefully you'll cover some of the detail, I don't want to take oh, don't worry. take the <laughs> steam out of stuff. it. But I do want to highlight a couple of, of issues there and then turn to some more of the, uh, what we're calling the global energy security strategy approach in the book. And then I, I really look forward to the discussion and, and engagement rather than our simply being talking heads. Uh, so on Russia and Eurasia, I'd like to make just a couple of observations. Uh, the first is that the economic and political dependence on energy has certainly not been broken in Russia, nor for that matter in other CIS producers. The consequence is that even a small reduction in price could be a big blow first to places like Moscow, Astana, Baku, even Ashgabat that seem somehow to exist in its own bubble. 
<laughs> uh, these could be hit quite hard. And it would be politically quite consequential if these changes were to occur at a time of leadership change in any of these countries. And, and over and over again, when we look at this, uh, we have resisted dealing with energy just as energy. We have said, look, an integrated approach where energy and foreign policy and climate and economy, national security, should be brought together. And we cannot afford to do this simply as an island, you know. Here, we in the U.S. decree that we will have an energy policy separate from the rest of the world. We have to be very, very conscious of the changes in other countries uh, and of the fact that the market in oil is a consolidated market, of course, and the market in gas is increasingly so. But getting back to the Russia-Eurasia area, the, uh, the vulnerability uh, of the regimes is high in the energy field, and their margin is very limited in terms of price increases. Uh, I would argue much more so, for example, than, say, the Gulf, uh, where the Saudis have more latitude relative to Russia and Eurasia. And uh, that's strategically, I think, quite consequential. I also thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about Ukraine, but I hope there will be a rip-roaring discussion of that uh, with, with all of you, because it's, it's underway. And uh, it's underway not only in Ukraine, but uh, less visibly, less reported in other parts of the former <coughs> Soviet Union, uh, places like Belarus and Moldova, which have been exposed to huge pressures. And I think that has enormous consequences for the independence of the post-Soviet states. Uh, thinking back to my time in the Clinton years, uh, one of the great objectives that we had was to make sure that we supported the economic and political independence of the post-Soviet states. And their access to world energy markets was and is a key factor. Yes, we were also concerned about going around Iran, but independently of that, we felt that it was a, a critical factor to make sure that these countries did not have to depend on transportation through Russia and could somehow access the international market, which is why, for example, we spent some more time on the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline. I vividly remember the primary corporate sponsors at that time thinking that these ideas were ridiculous, quote, strategic ideas. Whenever you say strategic in the corporate world, people reach for their wallets. Um, <laughs> So there, there we were with Sandy Berger, uh, and I, I'm sure you wouldn't mind this story one bit, and with the senior people uh, from VP, and we explained to them just how important it was that if there was any chance of their being involved, they get, better get involved sooner rather than later as a lead investor uh, in the uh, BTC. Now having said that, ironically, uh, the company that I spent time with, Chevron, has become the lead after VP through a, con a series of consequences of mergers, actually, so that you really have a, a major British role, but also an important American role, and other companies involved as well. So the idea was to put together the foreign policy and the strategic policy with the uh, commercial engagement, and to interact effectively with our investors, and also with the countries in which we were investing, who had a crucial desire to uh, ensure their own independence. I mean, when you think of uh, Gaidar Aliyev, whatever one thinks about his repressive politics, which were uh, uh, extensive, shall we say, uh, he understood from the get-go how important it was to get his oil and gas produced and to make sure that it was piped out, not through Russian territory. Same thing for President, President Nazarbayev. I mean, this is a crucial issue for them in terms of their own independence and autonomy. Now, why is this all important? Because in recent years, there's, there's been a progressive lessening of that energy independence on the, on the part of these states. And dramatically, we see in the Maidan Square in Kiev a drama unfolding uh, between return to a neo-Soviet orbit or reconnection to the West. But this drama is also unfolding in similar ways, not as acute, in other parts of the post-Soviet space. And it's interesting to see how easily even robust 
countries in that region, relatively so, uh, can be pressured through energy and energy instruments. And just think about it. A $15 billion <coughs> Russian credit and reduced gas prom prices, which any time can be increased, were key levers used to disrupt Ukraine's pending economic agreement with the European <coughs> Union. So this is a critical point where the country of Ukraine, which was on a path in the direction of increased association, economically so, and over time hopefully otherwise, uh, with Europe and the West, through uh, its economic vulnerability, and especially its energy vulnerability, has been moved in the other direction. Now, obviously, this is not the whole story. I mean, the drama of <coughs> Yanukovych and Timoshenko and all of that, you know, uh, the opponents and the crowds in the street. I, I recently saw The Square, which is all about the Egypt, the Egypt drama, and every, all the time I was thinking, well, it, it, it is a different region, but what about the other square? you know, in Ukraine. Now, think again about American policy here. If you compare the strategic importance of a Ukraine with, say, an Afghanistan, sorry to say, uh, it's sobering to realize that 1.5 1 to, 1 to, say, 3% of our funding for Kabul could have matched the offer that President Yanukovych felt that he could ill afford to refuse from President Putin. Quite a comment, I think, on U.S. strategy since 2001. It's not to say that money is everything, but I think we had, had and we still have, arguably, and I, I would encourage discussion on this, an opportunity to act as real partners and allies with Europe to make a difference in places like Ukraine, which can either go right back into the old uh, orbit, or can, you know, uh, slowly and in a difficult way develop their relationship with the West. And I would argue that this is especially important because in Russia itself, changes are going on. Uh, yes, Mr. Putin has been there a long time, and he'll be there for a good long, long time later from now. But there are changes going on within Russia, uh, not only in terms of um, readiness to oppose power in ways that are quite stunning and, and, and courageous, but in terms of the economy itself, where, you know, the old monopolies, the gas problems of Russia, and the increasing Rosnefts of Russia, which are sort of taking over the gas and oil space, are being challenged in very fundamental ways. Uh, what am I talking about here? I'm talking about the fact that in uh, gas monopoly Russia, uh, Gazprom is unpleasantly finding that there's a company called Novatech, a company called Novatech, which also has its supporters high up in the Kremlin, and which is taking up a lot of the space internally. Uh, in the case of Rosneft, yes, it has a very important sponsor. It's expanding in its strength in Russia. But there's also a company called Gazprom Neft, which actually is. Uh, semi-independently run, which is also competing internally. And you add to that the external competition that Russia is facing. Remember, in this area of energy, which is crucial to the stability of the country, which <coughs> covers uh, a very substantial part of the budget of that country, uh, which accounts for a very high part of the GDP of that country, it is finding tremendous uh, counter-pressures from European insistence on competitive rules in its space, and from Chinese insistence uh, on uh, uh, not agreeing to these high prices that Gazprom wants to get for its uh, gas and finding alternative sources, uh, including Turkmenistan, to supply that. So, so here we are. We have increasing struggle within and outside of Russia. We do have a very strong uh, a government there which is seeking to restore more of the aspects of the old system. And we have countries like Ukraine, which in which the population has uh, uh, been uh, more and more strongly opposed to the governments of the government, to the policies of the government, even in eastern Ukraine, where demonstrations are occurring now. And what do we do? For 1.5 to 3 percent of what we paid in Afghanistan, we do nothing. 
relatively speaking. And I think that's very strange. And I would welcome any comments on that. Now, let me close. Uh, I said a lot about that, but I really feel passionate about this part of the world, as you can see. Um, uh, David pointed out that uh, uh, we have a, a little strategy. Uh, we're calling it a, a global uh, energy security strategy. Uh, guess, not yes, uh, but guess. Uh, and going for guess is a matter of, it has several, we have a list of, of particular measures, which I will not inflict on you uh, right now, but the critical point that we're making in GUESS is that there's, there should be no such thing as an independent national energy security strategy. Uh, we've tried that for a good 40 to 50 years, and we failed here in the U.S. anyway. We can't pull together a, an energy strategy that's worth calling a strategy. But the point about the energy system today is we find ourselves more and more in a level playing field with the old producers. And they themselves are consumers. And the Middle East is the third largest consumer uh, after Japan, uh, after China and India, for example. And we, the consumers, who thought we were uh, sentenced forever to import more and more oil and gas from the outside, find to our surprise that technology is giving a gift of more and more self-sufficiency. And we make the point really clearly that the answer to this is interdependence and a global approach to energy security problems. And we feel that if we are active, as I try to intimate in the Russian Eurasian area, in the tough cases, or if we're active in the Middle East cases, we'll be hearing about those in a moment, uh, and we have a, a global view of what energy can do for us, uh, then uh, we will not have the past four decades of dependence since the Arab oil embargo, but we'll be able to embark uh, on a new strategy uh, which will go to the benefit of ourselves, our partners, our allies, even in the tough cases that we face. Thank you, Jan. I would note that yesterday the President did mention Ukraine and the State of the Union speech. He didn't mention Russia. I'm not sure when a President's ever mentioned Ukraine before in the State of well, the Union speech. Well, there was a certain H.W. Bush who did it in Kiev, you remember that? <laughs> That's right. We won't go back to that now. <laughs> Julia. Well, that's interesting. Um, Jan did cover a lot of ground, and I guess um, I was just thinking in terms of the U.S. engagement in this region, and certainly he argues the U.S. should be more engaged with Ukraine. Uh, I think certainly the Europeans are the ones that are the most um, immediately touched by the issues in Ukraine, but it will be interesting to see how the U.S. Um, deals with this region after Afghanistan, because if we actually withdraw our troops from Afghanistan, in a way that will, again, limit our engagement in the Caspian and with the countries of the Caspian, mm -hmm. Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan. I mean, all these countries are now trying to stay relevant, particularly Kazakhstan, which is a, a pretty important energy producer and where there are um, sizable foreign companies, including U.S. companies, that are big investors there. In fact, it is really Chevron that drives today um, the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian, I'm sorry, maybe eventually, but the Kazakh energy sector. Uh, Chevron is one of the uh, most important investors in Kazakhstan. Uh, but I think the changes in the region are also coming from the fact that, as Dave mentioned, that um, you know one of the uh, uh, reasons that, or two of the reasons, I guess, the U.S. was really in the Caspian to begin with was the uh, isolation of Iran. And that policy is shifting now in ways that we don't quite know where it's going to go. But um, clearly, if, if there were a deal with Iran, it would completely um, alter the dynamics of the relationships in the um, Russia-Caspian region. And we were there also to create multiple pipelines. And with the building of the BTC pipeline, you know, in a sense, the U.S. did accomplish what it had uh, really tried to be involved with in the Caspian and the CPC pipeline, which is the pipeline that goes from Kazakhstan out through Russia. And in fact, I would say that the U.S. accomplished two things. One was a private pipeline that went out from Azerbaijan, the BTC pipeline, and the second one was a private pipeline that went out through Russia. 
Now, admittedly, that doesn't diversify the roots as much, but clearly the U.S. did um, have a major role in creating options for exports of uh, oil from this region. Now, in terms of exports of gas, I think that's something that's coming up, and I know Brenda will address that, but that's really the next um, kind of uh, battle line, because in a sense, um, if we look at the uh, Russia-Caspian uh, region, uh, really the issue is that um, Gazprom is a very major player in terms of being a, a big producer and a big exporter from uh, Russia into Europe. And the next big challenger could be Azerbaijan uh, with its um, you know, growing gas reserves and growing opportunities to produce gas. And the question is, um, you know, how will that pipeline to uh, bring gas from Azerbaijan out through Turkey into Europe? And what time frame will it be built? Will there be other issues along the way that could um, delay that? But uh, And then, you know, the competition between Azerbaijan and Russia, I guess, in Europe is an interesting one. Because in a sense, what happened along the way is that Turkmenistan became a competitor to Gazprom in China. And one of the reasons that Gazprom has been slow off the mark, I guess, to be able to penetrate the Chinese market is because um, Turkmenistan got there first and was able to create a pricing framework that isn't necessarily as high as the framework that Gazprom would like. But one of the things we can't forget is that Russia is the largest oil producer in the world today. And in fact, you know, I, I look back on, um, as analysts, you know, we were always trying to predict what would happen with Russian oil and gas. And, you know, five or six or eight years ago, um, uh, there was this view, would Russia really be able to produce 10 million barrels a day and hold the production at 10 million barrels a day? Well, it seems to be that Russia, yes, can produce 10, and 10.5 million barrels a day was its average production last year. It seems to be the projection going out now that Russia will be able to meet this high production level over the next few years. And even for gas, I think the a few years ago the question was, can Gazprom really produce the necessary gas? Now the issue for Russia is that it has a lot of gas. And as Jan mentioned, uh, Novatech, a private company, produces gas. Rosneft produces gas. Gazprom produces gas. There's so much gas in Russia, they just don't have the markets for it. And that's really the issue is markets. And the major market for Russian gas right now is Europe. And uh, clearly, Russia wants to hold on to that market. And I think the battle over Ukraine is as much about the battle for um, the gas networks of that country holding on to Ukraine as a gas market as well. Ukraine is a sizable gas market for Russia. And, um, you know, essentially, um, then creating other pipelines that will carry Russian gas into Europe. And Azerbaijan comes in then as a competitor. And that, you know, while I think there's plenty of room in Europe potentially for um, uh, all these uh, sources of gas, I think it will be interesting to see how that competition plays out. Uh, the issue of Iran is actually quite interesting because if one looks back at 1997, which is when the U.S. became very involved in the Russia-Caspian region, and we began to uh, try and argue for um, creating networks, even a gas pipeline from Turkmenistan under the sea in the late 1990s, we were uh, very much in favor of that. Um, while we were doing that, and while we were very much focused on this whole Western route and getting around Iran, I think that was when the Chinese began moving in pretty heavily into the Caspian region. And uh, they laid down stakes in Kazakhstan, and they laid down stakes in Turkmenistan. And essentially, you can kind of divide this region now in, in two, because you have the eastern side of the Caspian, which orients to China, and you have the western side of the Caspian, which is essentially Azerbaijan, orienting to Europe. And so the big question will be for the future, and um, even as the US is looking at this pivot to Asia, I guess is how much can Russia pivot to Asia? Because Russia has been very much a European-focused power. And it's only now beginning to see value um, in terms of uh, getting to Asian oil and gas markets and establishing a, a, a stronger presence in Asia. What we're all waiting to see is when Putin goes to China in May, uh, there's, uh, you know, there was a view that there would be a deal with Gazprom already earlier, like actually this week, one of the um, 
uh, I guess, useless that Gaspar might actually conclude a pricing deal with the Chinese, is whether in May, when uh, Putin goes to China, there will finally be a deal that is signed with the Chinese for Gazprom to ship pipeline gas to that market. Um, if there isn't, I think it's uh, all is not lost because clearly the Russians and the Chinese are forming stronger ties already in terms of um, uh, investments by uh, Chinese state company CMPC now in a large LNG project in Russia with uh, private producer Novatech. And Rosneft has uh, a commitment now with China whereby it will sell over a million barrels a day to the Chinese market by the end of this decade. So in a sense, Russia is trying to reorient its oil and gas markets to the east and trying to capture more opportunities there. But the um, question of energy security, obviously, for um, the US when it comes to this region, I think we're not as we're not dependent on Russian oil. We do get buy Russian products, uh, refined products, but it's not as critical for us as it is for Europe. So I think the reasons the U.S. may not have been as much involved in Ukraine is because you know all of that affects us indirectly, but it's not as much of a direct effect as it is for Europe. The relationship with Russia, I think. And Angela knows this very well because she studied, studied it closely. But the U.S.-Russian relationship has a lot of problems. And Putin was just in Brussels this week. The European-Russian relationship has a lot of problems. So I think what will be interesting going forward is as this, you have this major oil power sitting in um, uh, the Russia-Caspian region, which is Russia, major gas power, and its relationships with both um, the Europeans and the U.S. Um, have deteriorated considerably. Uh, it can't figure out what to do about China. I think that's what we're all trying to figure out. And that is the big market um, in the East. So I suppose I'm just throwing out all of these ideas because as far as U.S. energy security goes, and uh, Dave did mention this, you know, we have our own oil and gas and in North America we're pretty secure. But there is this whole other world out there of countries that um, are big producers and that are basically trying to make sure that they can uh, secure their markets um, in probably some of the same places that our companies, which are big producers as well, will be going. And they, the Asia markets are really the big market. So I think I'll end on that note. Thank you very much. Brenda? <coughs> Hey, good evening. Um, I'm going to start with a few um, discussion of a few of the theoretical aspects of the book and then talk about how some of those are relevant for Iran and the Eastern Mediterranean and also a little bit of the um, Caspian region. Try to do all that in 10 minutes. So a big theme of the first part of the book is how difficult it is to predict anything in energy. And most books, I would say, except for your book and Dan Jurgen's books, have a very poor shelf life in energy. By the time they come out, if they're talking about a specific case, those factors are already gone. But this book, the 2005 version, this version as well, it manages to give you actually some structures, some factors. How do you how do you guesstimate or estimate uh, energy trends? And if we look at, for instance, um, in the past year, the IEA has has changed its 30-year forecast BP as well. Uh, twice this, twice in 2013. Um, so if the 30-year forecast changes within a year, then we don't really have a 30-year you know forecast. And the book talks about this as well. The, doc, the book talks about, for instance, the surprise. We were talking for years about energy going from east to west. And who could imagine that now energy, the big players are energy going from west to east. And that's, that's a discussion. Who, who could have pred predicted that? Um, who could have predicted, for instance, that the United States would be beating Europe on climate change? So with no talk, no policy, just actually happening through technology, through, through, through the, and actually through the private sector, not through government. Who could imagine in Europe, um, even three years ago, that natural gas consumption would be going down, coal, coal consumption would be going up, Coal, coal consumption together with renewables would be going up. Who could, who could have imagined this kind of combination? This is actually 
through extensive policies and intervention brought to those kind of results. So it, it, it's, it's quite um, um, interesting. Who could have imagined when we were doing the BTC, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, that we had this the tremendous alliance in place between Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. And the whole question was, was there going to be the demand in Europe, the investment in Europe for, for this oil and for the, the gas pipeline going next to it? Today, we have no problem about European support investment from European companies, but Georgia and Turkey, big, big question marks about the orientation stability of these, of these, of these countries. And who could have imagined this uh, 10 years ago? So when we try to understand these trends also, not only do we not, is it very difficult to an anticipate these trends as you point out in the book, but how do we interpret these trends? So let's say for instance, the rise of, of North American, Canadian and American production, new gas discoveries in the Eastern Med, um, in, in West and, and East Africa, so new ga gas in new places that we didn't have before. Half of the, peop the analysts in the, in, the, in, the, in the business are talking about, well, this means actually LNG market, its market is going to start looking like oil markets, become globalized, in interconnected, um, no, no short-term short uh, spot market, no long-term contracts, right? But actually, if you're going to have a lot more pipeline source gases available, maybe LNG is going to become sort of a boutique type fuel because we're going to have pipeline available. And actually, maybe LNG markets are going to, are, are going to become even more uh, long-term contracts, more compartmentalized as we have more pipeline options. So, so the same, the new, the new volumes can lead you to actually very different conclusions about what markets will look, at, look like. Oh, for instance, the outcomes of liberalization. I love that word because who could be against liberalization, right? Are you, you know, who's for you know consolidation or you know something? But but uh, um, it, Europe is is it looks at the American example and say, hey, these guys went to marketization of oil, marketization of gas is going to be a great thing. Well, the only difference is in the United States, the largest producer of, of natural gas supplies three percent of the American market. We're in Europe, basically three three suppliers that are outside of Europe, each supply a third of the market. So there's nothing that, that Europe doesn't look like the United States. So, so what, is it, what hub pricing is going to look like for Henry Hub versus what it's going to look like for Baumgarten is going to be a very, a very different thing. Um, and how will it, will, it, will it have difficulty as you had in America if gas prices to incentivize very expensive gas, because it's probably one of the directions we're going, where there's a lot more gas a lot more oil, but a lot of it's going to be a lot more expensive um, than in the past. Take, for instance, a little, you know, the, what is the meaning of the, the, something that sort of went through our, through energy analysts, not a lot of noise fanfare about the, the, the decision not to have a, a FID on Stockman, a, one of the major fields in Russia. Well, this decision not to decide was a very important decision. It means that Russia isn't sure, as Julia pointed out, that what, what, is there a market in Europe, and isn't there to put expensive gas in place but actually, it means that when economic growth comes back to Europe, um, that gas won't be available. So the market, the market doesn't doesn't plan for for future growth. Um, and what will these hubs look like? That in the United States, you have pretty strong rule of law. You have a variety of companies. These hub, even in the even in even in the United States, we've had also. This is something that most of the energy analysts have, haven't been able to deal with because it's so scary. But we've had a whole series of of discoveries of manipulation of, of energy data, um, especially even with the oil price, which we thought was the most transparent and, and, and price at all. I, very few people have written about this because it's just too scary. It's like sort of sort of like a holy cow here that we don't even really know. What if we can't really rely on the on the, the on the on the oil data? But what are hubs going to look like when Gazprom is still the biggest player in the hub? You know, and, and can just shove gas into those hubs, and so you're going to have something that looks like free market, but is it really going to be um, um, f uh, free market? And again, as as some of the previous speakers put out, there is no level playing field when 75% of the oil and gas reserves in the hands are, are in the hands of national companies. So you might have these beautiful rules of the game set out by lawyers, but actually uh, with half the players with, with a very different uh, playbook. Um, a question that maybe I would say if I was going to have a small critique of the book, of course, I don't have any criticism of the book, but um, <laughs> the one that we have to be very careful is the US system, well, it might work here, it's not very applicable to most of us guys out there uh, in the other world, where there's, where there's uh, this is such a big market with so many different players, um, and when you try to apply a lot of the lessons from the US to other places, it doesn't uh, work as well. And I think there's another thing that I, you know, I hardly hear the word 
utility anymore. Uh, energy, and especially natural gas, electricity, we used to call these things utilities, a public good that public has the right to access to, has the right to an accessible price. Um, and we should be, as much as we're happy about what the private market has been able to do in shale gas, we should remember that also without government and putting the infrastructure in place, having a vision, having a policy, and, and, and the two of you said this quite well in the last chapter when you talk about, this is actually what I did this weekend, which is kind of sad just to read the book. But, uh, but when, you in, when you say in the last chapter, when you say in the last chapter, you know, how, how you actually want government, to ha US government to have a, you know, a vision and coordination uh, on, this, on this issue. And I think we should remember again that it, the gap the gas and electricity, and maybe even, you know, it's funny, we don't think of oil as utility, maybe in some ways we should think of it as, as a utility, it's something that we have to think of government having a role. So a few short comments on <laughs> regional issues. Um, I think we should talk, I think what another thing I'd like to praise in the book is that it talks about oil and gas, bo both oil and gas, where most books that talk about energy talk about oil, when actually really oil, security of supply has been solved a long time ago, we're only question of security of price and gas. Natural gas is so much more interesting because it's so much more political because of the, the permanent infrastructures that, that that move it around and the and the, and the high uh, production costs. Um, so first thing I praise for talking about gas. I'm going to so, so so most of my comments regionally are going to focus on on gas. So first thing, we're in the riskiest period we've ever known for for natural gas. No one can tell us what will be Europe, Europe's demand in a year, three years, five years. Chinese demand in three, five years. Uh, we didn't understand uh, U U U U.S. demand. I remember one of the most interesting uh, points I heard on this was that Dan Jurgen spoke in Malaysia at the International, International World Gas Conference and said that you know shale gas was happening for 30 years, not abroad, not in Malaysia, not in the East Med, not in Iran. Here in the United States, taking transparent loans from banks, hiring American companies with rigs, and it took the EIA 30 years to, to recognize what had happened in the United States. So again, we should be very modest about what we think we know what's happening around the world. So we're the riskiest period we've ever known for, for gas trends. Um, think of that in this very risky period, for instance, in December, just, just, just last month, there was an FID, final investment decision, to invest about $45 billion into the Southern Corridor, which will transit seven countries, six regulatory systems, four, se four separate commercial projects are involved, 12 com and 12 companies uh, that are involved. Just not even just for the contracts, actually in the, in the actual sh shareholders here. These are the type, and this is based on future European demand. Companies taking risks saying that I believe in, in the Eurozone. I believe in European economic growth. That's a big, that's a big one, but this is actually, what's really interesting here, this was private companies putting their money. They're not governments, not countries. And there was a very interesting alignment here of political goals and of commercial goals. So I think that, that this is something very interesting for us to, to, to study how, at this very risky period, one of the most, you know, sort of riskiest, biggest mega projects in gas that, you know, maybe, maybe uh, 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 historically. Um, and it's coming at a time where Europe, if you just watching the news, last couple of statements, Europe is <coughs> completely revising its, its energy policies, uh, maybe <coughs> still committed to climate change, but maybe not through renewables. Um, and so it's bringing in new volumes to Europe of get natural gas, maybe an indicator that it, it, it will have set conditions <coughs> for increased uh, consumption of natural gas. Um, and I, I think this also this project, the Southern Quarter, is important for us to learn about. Because if we look at Europe, and maybe this is something that maybe I could, could critique one of the articles in the book. If we look at Europe, Europe's overall security of supply situation, it looks not bad. But when you look at there's still some meaning to geography. And if you look at the physical periphery of Europe, those countries have completely different prices, completely different security of supply, completely different political challenges of, of dependence <coughs> on, on, on one supplier. Um, and so, for instance, this project addresses those markets in the periphery. So when you look at, like, what does 10 BCM mean to Europe? It doesn't mean much. <coughs> in Europe, Bulgaria, Greece, or Italy, this, this, this can mean uh, a lot. Um, it's also a question of, uh, um, of Interconnectors for years, gener for about 15 years, Europe has talked about the importance of interconnectors of having physical ability to move between markets. 
and it took a private project from outside now to incentivize those interconnectors in, in, in between southern Europe. It didn't happen until actually a project from outside said, okay, you want this gas, don't get those markets um, connected. Um, and another thing to throw out here is that if you look at Europe's supply problems, we read a lot about Ukraine, we read about gas shortages, but probably some of the biggest challenges to security supply here as well is extreme weather. Uh, in Washington, D.C., extreme weather. So, uh, um, so we have to think, when we're thinking about energy security, we have to think not so much just about our political relationships and um, contractual relationships, but also building redundant uh, uh, energy infrastructure that, that can actually help us when these periods of extreme uh, demand. A couple other points in the region. Um, Iran, definitely, you know, a, a big, a, a big question mark. I, I think that even if sanctions are removed and if the um, um, there was there was a reconciliation between the West and and. and Western business coming into Iran, I think it would be a long time before it was a, a producer, certainly in, in the question of gas. A couple of things we should remember that most companies, oil and gas companies left Iran way before the sanctions simply because it wasn't a good place to do business and because we're at a period with a lot of competition for oil and gas. They're going to go to a place where they can book the reserves, where they can pull their money out easily. Um, the extensive subsidies in Iran still makes the domestic market so unattractive until they pick that up and, and change subsidy policies, which is a very difficult thing to do uh, socially, stability-wise. And probably the biggest opposition to investment in Iran is going to be actually Russia, because really the only country that can give Russia a run for its money in Europe. Um, Southern border <coughs> could hit certain markets, it could kind of spice things up, but, but Iran is really the only country that could really be a threat to Iranian market. And we saw this before, um, 2009, the gas, the gas pipeline from uh, Iran to Armenia. Gas Prom bought up that pipeline and forced on Armenia that this would be a very small circumference so that it couldn't be a, you know, a supplier, let's say, from Armenia to Georgia and then make its way you know, across the Black Sea into the Balkans or, or so, so what, to Southern Europe. So, so, it, so it, maybe Western business will want to come in and probably Russia will find its way of... Uh, and Russia and Iran are neighboring states. This, this, we have to remember that now they're in alliance, but still uh, uh, Iran is Russia's Mexico, and it has a lot of levers there um, uh, for, for influence. Um, just one other point on the Eastern Med and also Middle, Middle East and Caspian, so some sort of general point is that um, I think we're going to see much more demand in the, the, the oil and gas producing regions themselves, as you pointed out, David, and, and also pointed out in the book, uh, especially, and maybe unfortunately, because many of these regions still really highly subsidize. Uh, uh, they, they got stuck that at the beginning, you have oil and gas, you want to give it cheaply to your population, they own the resource, um, but they get stuck, and just like, as, as David pointed out, Egypt went from oil exporter to importer, it's going from gas, exporter to, to importer. Um, this is happening throughout, throughout the region. So basically a really big policy issue that the US government with this export of ideas, it should export you know, how to get rid of these subsidies because they're so damaging and, and really could change just even as Saudi Arabia started putting its air conditioning on natural gas or another source, it could, it could another million barrels a day, right? It could release to uh, of oil. Um, and just the last point, is that the book does talk about interdependence. And I would be very careful that trade is not necessarily the same thing as interdependence. Sometimes trade is just trade. Um, and maybe it's dependence. Maybe it's one side is dependent and the other side isn't. I think there's a, we have this in the US kind of this uh, enthusiasm always that trade brings peace, trade brings uh, democracy, trade, trade brings uh, uh, close camaraderie, and sometimes trade is just uh, trade. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, I am going to ask the first question, and then I will uh, forewarn you I don't have to leave because I have a plane to catch, and Professor Schaefer will take over. Um, I wonder whether you could all address the issue, of the sort of broader issue of the impact of the shale revolution. Uh, we hear a lot about the impact, impact of what's happened in the United States in terms of our own energy self-sufficiency, something about what it might mean for other countries. I wonder if you could sort of look at that and then uh, shale developments and explorations in other countries, in Europe, in Russia, in China, uh, in Ukraine too. Mm. So I don't know who'd like to start off with that. I'll, I'll take a shot at, at, at a couple of them. I think the um, one big uh, impact of our shale revolution was the displacement of LNG around the world. And the displacement of LNG originally intended for the United States 
meant the lowering of prices for LNG. So this was quantitative easing three or four at the time. It was a big break for other countries. It also began to trigger the erosion of the correlation between oil and gas pricing. And that is a very big deal for Russia and for others because the issues with China and everything else are all over price. When oil is priced, with gas, natural gas is priced to oil, then it's then it's that's very expensive. But when you can get a break on that, as we created by what and LNG, then you have a more competitive market. So our displacement has created competition in those markets. That's one. The second, I think, the potential is to provide this democratization of energy, which is for Central and Eastern Europe, the ones most dependent, as, as Brenda talked about, and, and Jan and, and Julia as well. Um, but we're also talking Mexico, Argentina, uh, and other countries. Um, they don't have the capital, they don't have the access to technology, they don't have the access to the service industry, and they don't have private ownership. So it's a big challenge in these places, but you can also scale development. You can have one plot. You don't have redundant infrastructure. You can, in, you can, you can assure best practices. They have tools for safe and environmentally protective development that we don't really have, that we have to rely on the private sector for. So I think uh, that, that, that oil gas uh, erosion um, and the democratization, the potential democratization of energy are, are a couple of those big impacts. Anyone else? Jan, you want to? Well, I, no, I think that's absolutely right. I will only add that um, there's a danger of hyping uh, shale on a global basis. Uh, uh, shale formations are very different in different places and to simply say that well we're doing so well with shale here in the United States it'll be the same uh, in Central Europe or in China or wherever, Western Siberia. It, it, it depends very much on the nature of the rock and uh, one should not make assumptions that rock is the same wherever you find it uh, and, and anybody who watches this is very cautious about that. So uh, the company I'm associated with has uh, an extensive shale exploration uh, approach, uh, but, but, but we're very cautious about saying, well, that it equates into actual volumes. And we're concerned that the people who have these shale formations are jumping to conclusions about the, the actual available production, which are premature because the necessary testing, drilling, uh, actual uh, moving movement from exploration to production. This is a long process. It's not something that happens overnight. Uh, having said that, we're you know we other companies are extensively engaged, and we see some real promise. For example, in Argentina and other parts of the world. But um, let's just be careful about this. It's it's the story that Brenda was telling us. You know have to revise the estimates every year. Uh, well, we don't like doing that. It doesn't add to credibility of the effort. What we like to do is to see serious results and then analyze what they mean. We've been very extensively, just to finish, uh, involved uh, from Lithuania down to Ukraine. And, and the results really have been very different, as even initially, uh, you know, relatively optimistic for Ukraine. And we'd like to see those results. Others, unfortunately, did not prove out as we had hoped, or as other companies in this business had hoped. And then we have to look for something else. Julia? Yeah, the, I think the interesting <coughs> element and, and is that the shale uh, revolution created opportunities for international oil companies and countries where they couldn't get in otherwise. I mean, the reason that Chevron is in Ukraine, Shell is in Ukraine, um, is because of shale gas and the government's need uh, international companies and their technology. Moreover, I think Russia is an interesting um, case in point for tide oil. The Russians don't want to do shale gas. They have plenty of uh, conventional gas resources. But tide oil is um, an area that the Russian government has allowed Western companies to come in and help them because they have one of the largest conventional oil reserves in West Siberia. And I think that's actually a very interesting um, phenomenon to watch whether this is going to help Russia to be able to keep its oil production at these very high levels. Um, over time, if uh, companies like Exxon and Shell and Statoil, um, possibly others that will get into the CNI, whether they will be successful in Russia with the tight oil. Yeah. Brenda? Um, yeah, I'm out on the shale. <laughs> You're out on the shale. Okay, now I'm going to hand this into your very capable. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's have this adventure. Capable. Okay. 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 Okay.
Okay, so how, well, let's open it up to the audience. Alan. Okay. And introduce, please uh, stand up, give us your name and where you're um, I've got a couple of uh, observations. The first one is on David just talking about the, um, you know, the strategic importance of the Shell Revolution and what the United States can do with it. And I think that's very, very important. And I don't think the United States has realized the scale of the potential strategic advantage. Because I think currently what the United States is experiencing can only be, um, there's only one historical equivalent example. And that was the British example um, of the growth and use of coal in the British economy. And we, the best example of this, the, the, the greatest illustration I can give, is, the, is answering the Perrion's question. The Perrion's question was how could Britain, which at that time had half the population of France, fight a 20 year war with, 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 with France and manage to fund all the enemies of the Perrion across the continent, all their armies? maintain a global trading operation, even come to America and by the White House. How could they do this? I said, I mean, how could they do this? And the answer was, was that um, the, all of the enemies of England were essentially organic plant economies, and Britain was the only fossil fuel economy. And essentially, I'll give you some examples. In 1800, Britain was producing a million tons of pig iron. That would have required, in their plant economy, and it was sustainable uh, wood uh, use, 15 Englands. But the point was nobody could actually deliver that sort of production. They had, they were the only fossil fuel economy. And that gave an enormous, you know, all of you know, the cannons of the ships of the line, actually paying for those ships through manufactured goods sold across the world, was, was through that coal, the use of coal. 96% of coal production in 1800 was British. And that gives you a sense of what they were able to do. Now, it seems to me if you look at the United States today, you were saying earlier about the difficulty of the shell and shell elsewhere. It will will come, but it will take time. Mm. And I think the United States has probably for 10, possibly 20 years, a strategic advantage which, which has not existed anywhere in the world for the last 200 years. And the question for the US, I think, is to be actually able to work out how to deploy that effectively and make use of it whilst they have it. It will shrink, it will, it, will, it, will, it will diminish. But for a period, the US is going to have an advantage which they've never, no one has experienced except the Brits in, in, in the late 18th and early 19th century. And, and the question, I think, for US policymakers is to think through that, to think how to make most, most use of it. Because the, the difficulties, as you were saying, Jan, with, with, with shale development, it will come, but it, it, will, it will take some time to work out all the shell formations, there are lots of above ground problems which we've been finding out in Europe. Um, it will take time. So I'll next my, my, my own one of the I'm going to let them take a bite at that first and then we'll, we can take another round okay, of questions. Right, right, so, okay, so US ha has, does it have a strategic advantage and is it thinking out what to do with it? Who? Well, yeah, I, I, my, my, I hope my comments by saying we think these things can happen if we embrace it. Hmm. But the reality is, uh, particularly as you heard, you know, hints of it in the president's State of the Union speech last night, the administration at least is deeply divided about this issue because how can you be for <coughs> treating climate change as an existential issue and be for oil and gas production here and in other places? Mm -hmm. And that is cognitive dissonance of, you know, of an enormous scale from the administration. And so when you, they, they've evolved from basically being against it to tolerating it to now embracing natural gas as a substitute for coal. As a bridge. As a bridge, but it's a really long <laughs> bridge. Um, and, and, and tolerating the production of oil, and of course you didn't hear the word exports. And so the narrative that the administration is comfortable with is promote US production, lower gas prices, lower electricity prices, promote manufacturing. Do it safely and efficiently, full stop. And so this idea that we would really want to connect to the rest of the world is a subject of debate. And, and Brenda, you recognize it. It's an issue in Israel as well. It's not so clear if you have it, you want to export it. It's not so clear if you don't allow an export outlet when you have surpluses in these things that you can continue the boom. And so, you know, people want to hoard it, but every lesson of that kind of hoarding is that you end up killing the, the golden goose. Mm -hmm. So I think if people are really divided about using, embracing the production, and even more divided about whether you should use it as a tool. 
Um, and this is the debate you've seen in the LNG export policy, and it's beginning now in crude oil export policy. The foreign policy people are for it, but there's a lot of industry that wants to protect it. And so you can't get past the politics to get to the strategic element. So that's, at least for now, that's where we're stuck. Uh, I would add to that uh, that uh, in the shale area, the, the, the commercial drivers are pretty strong. I mean, let's, let's remember the way this whole thing started was not courtesy of the large companies, it was courtesy of the small wildcatters and others uh, who demonstrated this uh, and then made it clear to the larger uh, actors that this was a, a necessary kind of activity. And secondly, let us recall that the, the larger actors have uh, by and large adopted a very expansive uh, commercial policy of uh, global development of shale. Uh, one could argue as a strategic matter that what we should try to do is somehow take more advantage of this at home and not you know, have a, as much advantage taken elsewhere. But as a commercial reality, I don't think that is a consequence. Uh, what I think is much more of concern uh, from the point of view of administration policy, and, and I really don't understand, well, I do understand because it's all about politics, so mm -hmm. is it not? Every, all of this is permeated by politics. So let's, let's pretend for just a moment that West Virginia does not exist. Uh, Anyone here from West Virginia? Uh, I apologize. It's a beautiful state. Yeah. Uh, but on coal, this is not a We are exporting more and more coal to the rest of the world. And when people complain about oil, let alone gas as a bridge, you know, I have a very good friend who said to me, you know, God, what we have to do is, you know, really get away from these fossil fuels, oil and gas, and go into the solar future and so forth. And I say, the more you go into the solar future, the more I, the more happy I am. I'm with you. And I said, why didn't you mention coal? And the answer is, politics. Nobody's going to dare to take on the coal interests in the United States. And if, if the consequence of our regulatory policy is less coal going into our electric power plants, you can be sure that it will be exper exporting a lot of that overseas to the detriment of the climate that we all share. So, something to think about. I guess the issue is more dire for Europe. You know, what happens to the industrial competitiveness of Europe? And I was just, uh, you know, Fadim Farol, uh, the IEA's chief economist, he had really interesting comments on that just today in the FT. And he was saying that Europe needs to embrace shale gas. They need to get Gazprom to lower gas prices. He didn't say Gazprom, but he said, you know, gas suppliers have to lower their gas prices. Renewables are important and nuclear is important because the problem for Europe is they've got huge employment and heavy industry. And if Europe doesn't get its energy costs under control, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. And so the U U.S. is in a prime position, but I guess as our allies in Europe, but it's fascinating to see, and that comes back to Brenda's point, you know, about demand, and we just don't know what's going to happen in Europe in the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a graduate student at the Security Studies Program here. I'm just going to preface my question by saying I have no knowledge about, uh, you know, very little about economics and even less about energy, so you have to bear with me. Well, that's like, you need to read the book. 95% <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of the book. Buy the book. He'll give you a discount. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, my question is uh, generally directed at Mr. Goldwyn, uh, and specifically your opening comments. Um, as I understand it, there are currently laws preventing the export of oil from the United States. I have a friend who's uh, an engineer, works in uh, facilitating transport of oil works down in Texas and said there's a big lobbying movement right now to change those laws. Um, and I'm, cer I'm certainly fascinated by foreign policy implications you suggested. Uh, however, I was hoping you could talk about uh, how floating oil and or natural gas, if we don't export that, I'm not sure, um, on the global market would impact energy prices here in the United States and further how that, how potential rise in prices could impact growth in industry and jobs. Um, and second, how much leverage the United States government would actually have um, for foreign policy purposes um, as the oil industry is privatized. And once you unleash that beast, all kinds of webs and connections get made that sometimes the government has trouble really reining in and controlling. This is somebody who does not understand the <laughs> <laughs> 
Good um, question. <laughs> and there's a hearing tomorrow. The Senate Energy Committee is having a, a hearing uh, exactly on, on this issue and debating the, the very questions you've raised. Um, the uh, U.S. laws prohibit the export uh, of, of oil, um, except if it's going to be refined in, in Canada. And that was a short supply regulation which came from, you know, from, from 1973. U.S. production, the way, our, the way, the way the work, our economy works right now, is we built our refining system to consume cheap, heavy oil, because we thought that's what the future of crude slave is going to look like. And it turns out now we are producing light oil in abundance. You don't put light oil into a heavy oil refinery because it's kind of like pouring champagne and you know Dom Perignon and your own so you might want to use something else. It's not efficient. It doesn't produce it the same. Well, I so, read the book over the weekend. I see what you did. <laughs> <laughs> so we're so we import still some heavy oil, basically the cheapest oil we import anywhere in the world. Most of it comes from Canada, also Mexico, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, and Venezuela. Um, and so um, so that's pretty cheap. This light oil we're blending it, but it's basically in surplus. And so the price on the world market of that quality of oil is about $110. The price trapped in the Midwest is about 65 That's the issue. Billions of dollars of giveaway, and essentially, we don't need it. We need other stuff. And so the argument for trade is, if we export that stuff, increasing the global supply, directionally, you increase supply, price goes down. That's a break. Also, who are we going to sell that, that oil to? We can sell that to people who buy light oil, who find it scarce. They tend to be in Europe or in, uh, or in Asia. So that's a big tool. The government can't direct where it goes. It can just say that it's okay to export it, and then you're right. Private companies sell it wherever they want. But the Japanese have already been here, and the Brits in the trade talks saying, gee, if you really want to trade with us, we'd love to have this. Get, and so, and so the, 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 at least uh, this needs to be studied. But the, um, the, the economists argue that gasoline is already globally priced. So you get, you know, it's already priced the global price of oil. And so if you export this, and we have no restrictions on the export of products, we export a million, 1.3 million barrels a day in oil equivalent in products. So we're already exporting gasoline and diesel and propane. So if you export this light oil, directionally, you might reduce the price of, uh, of gasoline by reducing global crude prices. But if nothing else, it's probably a wash. The argument on gas is a little bit different. We can export gas freely to Canada and Mexico, anybody they have a free trade agreement with. We don't have a free trade, free trade agreement with most uh, gas consumers. So you have to get a permit and find it's in the national interest. And that debate has been over the same question. If we export gas, then we'll need to raise domestic prices and kill the manufacturing boom. There have been now at least eight studies, including one commissioned by the Department of Energy, which, long story short, say producers will increase production to meet new demand, i.e. LNG demand. We are awash in gas. The supply curve is essentially flat. Petroleum product producers don't really need the dry gas. They want the byproducts. So you export the dry gas. Those byproducts stay in the US and are available for propanes, butanes, and other things anyway. So over a 15, 20 year period, for the amount of LNG that the world will tolerate, limited market, limited number of LNG importing terminals, the, the price increase would be anywhere between a dime and 35 cents, which is what you see on a cold day in the US. So it seems that the price effects dom domestically are somewhat negligible. The foreign policy impacts, well, you can't direct them. The ability to connect to the world is the reason Asia is in the Trans Pacific Partnership. I mean, the reason we brought the Japanese, the Koreans, and everyone else. They want the gas. And for TTIP, for the one with the Europeans, too, if we can put that on the table and give them a choice versus Africa, versus the Middle East, at least the Japanese buyers are saying, we pay a premium to know that we have supply from a reliable country. I would just add, like Australia. You know, I, I mean, it's not a joke. I mean, Australia is producing an enormous amount of gas and has long-term contracts with the likes of Japan. And, and why is this such a great thing? Because they have uh, volume and credibility and reliability. And it's not a, it should not be a far-fetched notion for us Americans to have a little bit of that, too. Uh, and it could give us a great deal of benefit, both in a trade context and a foreign policy context. Julia? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, the way in the back. Yeah. The way in the view. Yeah. You, yeah. Uh, I'm an undergraduate student at SFS here, and um, I was thinking about the like recent Iran-Russia gas deal. 
Uh, we said Russia is looking for new markets to export its surplus of natural gas. And um, also, if Iran sells more gas to the market, the prices are going to fall. Basically. So this doesn't look quite rational. What's what could be like Russia's motive behind this agreement? Is it just a political one, or is there something? Like that? Uh, okay, I, I'm happy to. Sp there is no deal so far. You know this trade for between Iran and Russia. They haven't concluded anything. It's just something that's been talked about, and in fact. If you look at it, it's been talked about more from the Russian side than it has the Iranian side. Now, there could be something going on, but so far, um, I think the Russians have talked it up more as because, as Brenda said, I think this competition from Iran is something that will eventually be harmful to Russia if it happens. So, in a way, it's in Russia's interest to start talking up a deal like this, which then gets the U.S. Congress upset and, you know, potentially then creates an environment for more sanctions here. Um, but I, um, I think for Iran, though, on the gas side, quite honestly, uh, it'll take some time for Iran to gear up to become a serious exporter of gas. There's no question. It's behind the curve. It needs the technology, it needs the investment, and it has a big domestic market. Um, and just to add there that, you know, Iran, despite sitting on um, probably the third biggest volumes of natu natural gas in the world, it's a net natural gas uh, importer. Mm -hmm. and secondly, like what, what, what Julia was saying, that they use, the gas is so highly, gas electricity is so highly subsidized in Iran that actually they need to import more gas than they, they, they export. So at this point, it's true, they, there is no competition. but. But um, with Russia in the long run, if you want to understand, like to understand this whole element of, of potential competition between Russia and Iran, look at Russia's policies on the sanctions. They're quite per, per, uh, perplexing. On one hand, um, Russia uh, is not in favor of the sanctions in general. On the other hand, at the end of the day, they support sanctions. And we see, I, I see Russia's policy on Iran, it's sort of like a rudder that changes sort of the course, of, just keeps the boat on course, which is Iran in a box, meaning that on one hand, not such an escalation of the conflict between Iran and the West that the West comes in and attacks, and then you know you have this Iraq scenario where it's Western business and, and Western presence, and therefore um, Iran's oil and gas sector could open with all the competition for Russia and, and, and other political issues for bringing the West closer to Russia's border. On the other hand, um, Russia doesn't let Iran get to some sort of nuclear breakout, which also wouldn't be in the Iranian Russian interest. Again, as a country that, that borders Iran and is, and, and is in, as the both sort of sharing a very uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus as, as their as their roaming zone. So you see that Russia's policy is constantly to keep Iran not in conflict, but you know not out of the box. Um, and I think the energy issue is a, is a primary element here for Russia. You know, it's worth mentioning um, President Rouhani's proposal in Davos, which was that uh, there be an oil industry conference in Tehran. And uh, what I think of is the frame of the positive impact of sanctions applied today, and the possibility, who knows, of uh, negotiations leading to a more positive result, whereby incrementally talking about possibilities for cooperation in other sectors that are important uh, can be used to advance the, the critical and the priority objective of preventing Iran from going into a nuclear weapons program. Um, I'm of the view personally that any, any thought of by the Hill of having sanctions right now uh, is completely counterproductive and I, I certainly think that one has to have a a very uh, clear-eyed and verification-based approach to uh, what the Iran Iranians may or may not be prepared to do. And it's not just Rouhani, it's all the people around them. And even if they wanted to do it, you know, there are plenty of people who will not want to do it. But the possibility, the, the prospect of, on the one hand, if negotiations fail, of very effective uh, sanctions being applied, as the President indicated in the State of the Union, or, on the other hand, if uh, there is a positive movement of some significant discussion, I'm not talking about investment as such or technology transfer or anything like that, amongst uh, people who have like views of the uh, importance of development, is the key to a strategic approach. 
And it's very complicated because there are all sorts of domestic constituencies that get in the way of, in all of the country involved in this matter. And I'm sure you have your own views <laughs> on all this, but I didn't want to flag. Is that a little racial profiling there? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, I, I would hope you have your own views of uh, being uh, somewhat so associated with these issues of the region. But having said that, um, um, we need a strategy. You know, and, and it, is, it, it, it needs to go beyond six and 12 months to uh, describing a future, alternative futures, uh, either of, of really credible negative results if uh, uh, the country moves in the nuclear weapons direction or the opportunity for something more hopeful if it does not. I'm sure that everybody will jump on that, but I wanted just to flag that. And the Rouhani uh, statement in Davos, I think, is well worth thinking about. David, do you have some? Ron? Yeah, sure. I, mean, I would point out, just because of the Iraq example you gave, Iraq ended up being a BP Luke oil shell province. There's one American company there, and everybody else needs to be bailing out as quickly as possible. So um, it wasn't, uh, it didn't end up being. China. Uh, China, China, right. China will be in Iran. <laughs> Anywhere at all. Yeah. And, that, and that's because, uh, in part because the terms are so bad. And that has been the issue, as you pointed out, for Iran for a long time with these kind of agreements. You know, you can't, you can't make money as big as the resources. Companies are not going to want to go. Right. But I would, I would agree with Jan. The Libya example shows that the prospect of oil investment is a big carrot for, for countries. It played a role in Gaddafi giving up weapons of mass destruction and renouncing terrorism. But there were heritage U.S. companies there. So it's absolutely a uh, carrot, um, and I think, um, and it probably is for Iran. They may get in their own way as they have for, for years when there were unilateral sanctions and have equally unattractive terms. But the Iranians need to think about what Iran would be like with a competitive system. Because whatever they think they're making from, in terms of regional power, from having a nuclear program, would really be dwarfed by the prospect of being a major oil and gas producer. Strategically, it would position them very powerfully against both Saudi Arabia and Iraq. It would make them central to Europe by being able to provide supply. It might be a decade off, but they could be a long-term LNG supplier to Asia if we allow them to have the, uh, have the equipment. And global projections of demand for oil are huge, and they are centrally placed. So they can have all that, but they're not going to have any of it until basically we left our sanctions, especially on, on LNG. So it's a huge pivot for them. You know, and it, it, it comes down to whether or not, you know, they really mean it and whether this is they're not just give up this program, but whether they're gonna give up implacable hostility towards the rest and the rest of the region. So, you know, I think the carrot ought to be as ripe as we can make it, but they don't get it until we get the commitments on everything else. But there's no question from an Iranian long term perspective their world could be radically different, but it's gonna it's gonna take a significant change in approach to, to do it. But you know the you know, the upside is enormous, and the status quo, you know, is is a, a downward spiral. I think. I just like to pick up on that. But I think there's tremendously different interests between the Iranian state and the Iranian regime. If you look at the Iranian state, your vision you know vision is correct, and probably most of the people of Iran share those same interests. But if the regime actually, uh, if, if the issues of con contention were removed between the West and the regime, that would be the end of the regime. And that's really been, I mean, that the, the olive leaf has been, was placed out by the Clinton administration. A, a, a number of times it, it was there, you know, these kind of deals were there on the table. And really, the Iranian regime has resisted it, not because, I don't even really think that they actually want to have a nuclear breakout, or, but reconciliation with the West means the end of this regime. How could they keep control of the people there when actually at the same time embracing America, trade with American interaction? And, and so I think, I think really the, the issue, and, and also I think there's a lesson too, if you look at a, um, the Iranian regime is quite, quite clever. They look at, there were four countries with sort of emerging nuclear programs that were in contention with, with the United States. It, 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 was, it was Libya, it was Iraq, North Korea, and Iran. Two of those countries gave up their nuclear programs. Those regimes are, are gone, and two countries have kept their nuclear programs going, North Korea and Iran. Those regimes are still in place. So from their perspective, nuclear program or cutting close to a nuclear breakdown is quite rational. If I was Iranian defense minister, I would also want to have a uh, nuclear weapon, especially because their, their conventional military system is so poor. They have really no air defense, no... I mean, there's more 
planes falling out of the air than, than, than have ever been shot down and uh, no significant Navy. So, you know, I'm saying if I was Defense Minister of Iran, not that I'm a candidate, but I would also probably go for <laughs> nuclear weapons and support for terror because it's, it's quite rational when you have a very weak conventional military. Can I ask you, Bernard, how yeah. personalized do you think that regime is when the Grand Ayatollah goes to the Great Beyond by, you know, by old age or, or a bad diet or whatever? I mean, does the regime continue? Is it personal, or do you think it's deeply institutional? Because there is this huge divide between the people and the regime. Right. So just by its own inertia, how long does that kind of regime last? Right. Well, that's really, I mean, that's about as hard as doing 30-year forecasts for energy. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I would put in two sort of, just like you do in the book, some of the sort of the, the drivers for, for the assessment. One, I, I, don't, I don't accept this good cop, bad cop, that there's Rouhani and these uh, reformers, and there's bad Khamenei and these old, this is one regime. The president of Iran has about a little bit more power than the Queen of England, and and but just maybe better dental work. And and, uh, um, and, and sorry, this is no, no jokes about the internet here. Um, but uh, but uh, she said it. She said it. But but, but the uh, 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 he's. Rouhani is president of Iran because it was convenient for the ruling regime in Iran to have him to be uh, pres president of Iran. There's no this great debate. This you know that there is a great de the U.S. has it. Congress versus the administration. They have they have this debate going in, in Iran. There there is one uh, regime. There's different interests of the people. There's different different sectors. But in the, in the regime, there, certainly the president is a very you know, almost uh, ceremonial role. He has some control over the budget and uh, some, some appointments. Second, though, balance longevity um, um, and it, 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 is a, that it's a classical rentier state in the sense that um, there are there are the whole vested groups of people that have such a tremendous economic interest in the continu continuity of the regime that that's really the problem. For instance, that most of the militias are, and, and different military organs they have they control different sectors of the economy. So for them. Regime change isn't about ideology, isn't about my, you know, my party in power versus your party, but it's your livelihood. And I think there's also a thing that the U.S. administration didn't understand in Syria. And I mean that it's, if you're out of power, it doesn't mean, okay, a different system of government. It means you starve as well, so you're going to fight, you know, you're going to fight to the death for your, your group to be in power. So I think that the strength of the regime comes from it that, that most of the Revolutionary Guards, the Quds forces, they control, they have such econ vested economic interests in this regime that they would lose um, that that's the real, you know, the problem, and it's uh, like classic rentier states. They have the money to, as long as you know. I think a lot of it will depend on the oil price. If the oil price takes a big dive, more than even the sanction, and there's even less money for the regime to hold control. That will probably matter more than, you know, probably more than the sanctions. Could I just uh, uh, add though that and that's very interesting yeah. that that uh, from the point of view of impact over time. Um, I personally had underestimated uh, how effective the, a sustained campaign of economic and financial sanctions could be. And um, I, I think those that, that pressed for this, in both administrations actually, uh, uh, deserve a great deal of credit because uh, we have some very effective leaders there and they're credible leaders and they've had real impact, added to which is gross mismanagement of the Iranian economy and the like, almost complete collapse of the economic system, which I think has been a fundamental driver mm -hmm. uh, in their readiness to have the discussions on the nuclear side. Now, so, so my vision is economically driven, uh, and it's uh, obviously based more on what we can affect, namely in the external environment. We can't do much about affecting the internal environment. They'll mismanage their own pro economy. They don't need much help from us on that, I think. But if the vision that's in their minds is that if we don't move forward in a serious way on this nuclear, the economy is in a shambles, which means great unrest and also less rent by definition. You know, your, your pie is not, not, not growing, it's getting less. Or on the other hand, uh, as David is describing, the, uh, you know, if there is a fundamental shift, the pie gets larger, there is greater revenue. Um, I'm not expecting every member of the Quds Force to say, hey, that's right, you know, now that you put it that way. But I, I am saying that there are people who are economically driven, clearly, 
uh, and then not just in the government, but also in you know the population in a, in a very visible way, who can be influenced by steady application of both the sanctions approach and the incentives and insistent application of our minimum standards on the nuclear. You know, so I'm thinking years, mm -hmm. but it ha it requires tremendous discipline, which is not what the United States is uh, renowned for uh, in this area. You know, consistent application and allied cohesion, and God knows we, we have people who are going to be total opposite. You know, our friends on the Hill, many of them say, no, it works so well before that we might as well hit them over the head with a sledgehammer while we're figuring out whether they're going to go ahead with a nuclear weapon. I, what's the point of that? You, you, you see whether it works or not, and then you have a, a clear and credible statement of what's going to happen if they agree and what's going to happen if they don't. And of course there are issues in, the, in Israel as well. You know, uh, I'm sure there's a large debate between the Prime Minister and others on this subject. Mm. So, you know, uh, I'm saying let's make the most of it, let's make sure we have a balanced strategy, not just one that emphasizes the, uh, the stick, it doesn't seem to be the way that things work. And, I mean, clearly the, the sanctions are always a tool and not a goal. They're right. a tool, that the, the, the end game is to make sure that there isn't a nuclear uh, Iran, um, nuclear weapons, and not sanctions per se as a, as a goal. Yeah. Uh, yes? Hmm. Hi, I'm Tori Beek with the American Council on Renewable Energy, and one of our initiatives is through national security and defense. And we work with the Department of Defense to try to assist them in their renewable energy goals. And an issue of primary importance specifically for branches of the military is how to monetize energy security. And so I came to this just generally curious, and it was a fantastic presentation, thank you very much. But we're quite curious to figure out if there's a general framework or sort of guidelines that one could follow to try to figure out how to monetize energy security and how to use that to assess whether the project is worth the monetary or physical investment. Well, the Pentagon, Pentagon as you know, and, uh, has really jumped on this because there are real consequences for from, uh, going ahead and having a, a much more cost-effective approach to fuel supplies and, you know, having more efficient systems and, uh, you know, has a huge impact in terms of the, of the cost, the budget, the defense budget. Um, so the more they can do that, the better. Um, in the non-defense area, since I'm not a defense specialist myself, you know, we, we have projects, uh, we, we have a, uh, a profit center that's based on energy efficiency. Um, called Chevron Energy Solutions based in San Francisco that does large scale work for the governments, you know, both in the state and the federal level. But on average, our you know the work of this company saves 30% in fuel costs. And it's through application of, you know, highly efficient uh, uses of energy, alternative uses, uh, solar, you know, all of these things. It's a combined approach. And when you think of multiplying that through the armed forces, that, that has enormous impact. And I, I think that perhaps uh, making sure that, the, and there is a lot of conversation going on, but making sure that there's a maximum discussion going on between those who are commercializing this in the private sector and those who are pursuing this uh, very proactively in the Pentagon is a good idea. I would just throw in there, I mean, it's hard, it's easy to quantify the, the, the benefits of substituting fuels or the benefits of reducing health costs. Um, it's hard to quantify the benefits, the security benefits. So for the Chinese, substituting gas for, for coal, you can figure out what's the difference in the commodity price and then what do they pay for the health system? And, and what does it cost to change the technology? And I think they're starting to think for themselves, that's a pretty good investment long term for energy security as long as they can get the gas. And so, but take another case I worked on at the State Department, which is Pakistan. You know, turn the lights on in Pakistan, keeping the regime from falling and being overthrown by people who are even worse. So, you know, you're quantifying the benefits of keeping the regime in power, killing terrorists, and not putting nuclear weapons in the hands of bad guys. I don't know how you price that, but I just put it as pretty valuable. Um, yeah. You know, and but you know, you can't say. Oh, well then we're going to, you know, we don't need 
you know, we don't need to have the fifth fleet patrolling the waters. We can deal with, you know, one fewer aircraft carrier. I think that's where it gets harder to do. But big categories, I look at energy security around the world, not ours, but what does it mean for Africa to have access to electricity? Charlie Abinger has a, a chapter on energy poverty. What does it mean not to have ungoverned spaces with people who are really unhappy with their lives in the Horn of Africa, in the rest of Africa, and to keep it from going the other way? Well, long term, it's priceless because you're talking about either a world of prosperity and trade partners or you're talking about an unending war against unhappy people or, or terror. So it's hard, to, it's hard to price it. I think the price of investment in access to electricity, gas and renewables together, something for base load and then something for, for peaking, is really cheap compared to the cost of everything we have to do militarily or even in terms of refugee flows or organized crime to defeat it. But if I can tell you from having not gotten funding for this kind of a program when I was in the State Department, <laughs> you're talking about $20 million for basic governance reform, it's a really hard sell. And ultimately, you know, without the policy change in these countries to get prices right, nobody wants to pour any money into it. But, you know, I think it's a, a great research project to figure out a way to quantify those benefits. Just something to add to that. We think of security of supply, we think of oil and gas, but we should be thinking of security of supply of electricity, because even in places where, or precisely places where there are lots of oil and gas supplies, we, we find actually the very poor electricity systems. Because of their bust and boom cycles of, uh, uh, of, of revenue, especially with their oil producers, they don't maintain their grids correctly, so they, they build these big, you know, ambitious projects and they don't have the money to maintain it. So you find that most of, for instance, the oil and gas producers have very poor electricity supplies, and I've, I've even noticed, I'm writing about it, something about this, that how even the connection between regime survivability or sustainability and, and electricity supplies. Uh, for months up until the fall of Mubarak, um, there were blackouts in, in Egypt and in Cairo, and people were having their iftar dinners during the Ramadan, and the lights were going out. They'd spent all this money bringing their families together, and suddenly the lights go out. If there's anything that illustrates to you state failure, oops, United States, but, but state mm -hmm. failure is when the lights go out and you're, you're, you know, you're a gas exporter and you can't even provide electricity to Cairo. So, you know, so you see the same thing, yeah. Iran with poor electricity provision, Nigeria. Uh, sorry, N Nigeria, Nigeria you know, yeah. it's precisely the places that have the resource. And so they might have the resource, but they don't actually get all the benefits to the public. One yeah. of my favorite stories is uh, during a visit to Yemen where obviously the kind of thing that you're facing, that, that Dave was describing is at stake, you know, the failure to deliver you know, the most basic services to the population. So I was visiting with the Minister of Power. We were talking about, you know, all the good things the Ministry was doing to make sure that they were dealing with this problem. And in mid-sentence of the Minister, the, the lights went out. And we just sat there talking for the rest of the meeting without the lights. So, you know, that was a pretty vivid example of the difference between uh, official optimism and reality <laughs> around this. I, I, I do see somebody who's been very patiently wait, waiting in back to raise a hand earlier. I don't know whether you still uh, want to do it. Thank you, sir. And also one other person, even further back. But you, do, you go ahead. And so you're, two, you're short, the two short yeah. questions we'll yeah. take. Okay. All right. Uh, first, uh, just to add on to what he was asking, the Navy is actually really taking in the forefront of look, using alternative fuels to power their conventional weapons, as you probably know that. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about as a conversation uh, you guys had about a year ago, two young gentlemen who are alumni from this university um, are with the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Kazakhstan. And one of the themes of their talk was that Kazakhstan is turning to India as a major trade partner. But we're talking about energy, speaking of people who could have, you know, the lights where the lights go off. Uh, is India a price taker, a price maker, a troublemaker? They sit in this one out. Thank you. Okay, then let's, let's add the question in the back, the patient man. Yeah, uh, Ken Meyer, World Docs. Uh, why hasn't uh, Saudi Arabia's supposed excess capacity not come into play uh, as we try to restrict Iran's oil sales? Uh, Saudi Arabia's failure to boost production has forced us to give exemptions from our sanctions to Japan and China and India. Uh, it seems like this is the appropriate time to use that excess capacity. Well, uh, 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 yeah, I think a fact check should be applied there because uh, the Saudis have, in fact, been uh, actively producing even at a time that uh, their benefits from, you know, constraining supply 
would indicate that they should do that. I, I think one should check the facts on it because uh, well, what, they, know, they have been consistently saying and acting uh, consistently with those statements in favor of uh, substituting for loss in production. David, I don't know whether you have any numbers on that in your great... I'm trying to see whether I got my 2010 numbers, but I can tell but you... It should be, it's a factual issue that should be checked first, in my view. Uh, going back to, to 2011 with the, um, the Libyan revolution and Saudi Arabia's produ production, it's not so much drawing spare capacity is defined by the ability to bring resources in the ground onto the market within 90 days. That's how the EIA does it. But Saudi Arabia has increased its production from around 8 million barrels a day, I think, to 9.5 million barrels a day between sort of, I guess, what was 2010 to now. So they actually ramped up production to help deal with the Libya shortfall and for their own self-interest. They have, they have sustained that production at those levels, you know, now nine point, they're they're really at, at, at record highs for Saudi Arabia, in part to uh, to account for the difference. It's not a good idea for the world to get below two million barrels a day because prices then tend to spike just on the panic, and a lot of that that Saudi capacity is heavy kind of stuff. Some people don't even count it as valuable. So that's, you know, there's there there could be yet another emergency to come. You know, we have you know when when we use the SPR, we think there's a real significant short-term emergency, but I think we've had you decent... Would, you would agree that it's a, a weakness of our sanctions no. that we have to allow Japan and China and India to continue to buy Iranian oil? No. No? Not at all. No, and I, I think, you know, the Saudis, it's in their interest to supply countries to the degree they can, and it's an oil quality issue, too, as Dave mentioned. And the Saudis produce more because, in fact, when you th look at Russia, they roll condensates into their production number, whereas the Saudis have crude oil plus condensates. So they're actually producing, I think, quite a bit more than 9.5 when you add in the condensates. Total liquids, yeah. Total liquids. So they're a, a large producer. And no, I mean, I, and I think the other countries have definitely reduced their intake of Iranian oil, but. Um, uh, Iran is only exporting like a million barrels a day now. It's really way below what they were exporting before. But if it hadn't been for us in Canada as well on top of that, it's not so clear we would have gotten even the kind of compliance we've gotten from China, Korea, and India. Just to answer the India, the India question, uh, I think an, India has, um, they potentially have shale, um, and they have some offshore gas, but if you're not reliant, you pretty much don't get a shot at any good acreage you're getting to produce it. So until, until India's system changes, they're going to be a price taker for gas, both for LNG and for pipe gas from whoever is going to supply it. And until they, they're able to muster the internal reform, some states will pay a market price for gas and therefore for electricity, but, until, but most states don't. So until there's a competitive price for electricity and therefore for the gas feedstock, then they're going to be energy starved for a while. And it's a very hard system, but hopefully one day they'll... Fix it. And I think for Kazakhstan and India, mm, I think the issue is money. I think China has a lot of money and it's a neighbor, and so clearly China has won the race for getting access to resources in Kazakhstan. <coughs> Any last comments from our panelists, from our authors? No, I, I, I just say that um, on the Chinese uh, side, um, I think it's very difficult for them to get positions unless they do pay money and try to sort of control the assets. And I, I think the only way to get them, and this is a whole new conversation, uh, but the only way to really get at the China problem is to uh, engage with them uh, ourselves in a different way and to expect them, and to, go, to offer them uh, benefits from uh, uh, participation in the international trading system and energy which is not apparent at the present time. So they were just reinforcing, in my view, bad behavior. Uh, so a thought, but it could be continued for an hour, I'm sure. My only final words are, uh, are thank you. Thank you for, for, thank for, you. Yes. 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 for organizing this thank and you. For, for giving us an opportunity. For a great audience. Yeah. Yeah. Julia, sure. thank you. That's it. Thank you all for Thank you very much. So actually, the real thank you goes to Corey Gill and to Eugene Umes, who organized our event here, the, the quiet faces that actually really brought this event. And, and thank you really for coming out tonight. I thought this was a fantastic panel. I learned a lot, it was very interesting, so please join me in thanking our, our authors.